My name is John Owen Henderson, and I am with Da Vinci Charter Academy High School. The veteran being interviewed is Stephen Platt, and today's date is December 2nd, 2016. We are in Davis, California. So, what year were you born in? 1968. Uh, and where was that? That was back in Urbana, Illinois. Huh. Um, do you, uh, what did your parents do? Uh, well, my folks were teachers um, and social workers. So oh, okay. And their names were? Steve Platt oh, okay. is my dad. Uh, and my grandfather was also Steve Platt, uh, but we're not juniors. We have different middle names. Hmm. And uh, my dad was a, uh, is a, or was a psychology professor. He's retired now. Um, and my mom was a social worker. Oh. Her name is Sherry. Hmm. Uh, Do you have any siblings? Uh, I have step and half siblings, oh, okay. uh, but I consider them siblings, nonetheless, so two younger and two older. Okay. Um, have any of them served in the military? Mm-mm. Okay. Uh, well, no, my uh, stepbrother served uh, for about four years. Yep. All right. Um, what is it that you did before you entered the service? Went to high school. So, and then, uh, and then I went off to a service academy. Um, so that was kind of set up for me at that point. So I ended up going to the Air Force Academy uh, out of high school. Okay. So. And where was that? High school or the academy? Uh, both. So high school was in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, uh, and then the academy was in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? Uh, well, I would consider an enlistment since I went to the academy. But once you're there, you're sort of, you know, stuck. Uh, once you once you've been in for a couple of years, so you owe some time. But yes, I would say I enlisted. And uh, what was your reason for that? I wanted to fly jets uh, when I was it when I was a young man, and then I grew into an appreciation for serving my country after that. So, um, what happened when you departed for training camp and during your early days of training? Uh, I went off to uh, the basic training prior to the academy, a part of the Air Force Academy, um, and uh, was um, brought into the military system from a very civilian uh, existence. So, uh, and and went through that training. It was it was a challenge for me. But, sorry. No, that's it. Oh, okay. Um, did any of your parents or grandparents serve in the military? Um, my grandfather, one of my grandfathers served during World War II. Uh, but other than that, uh, not as much. A, I think I had an uncle that served briefly. Um, and then my stepfather also served during World, World War II. So, what was it that they did? Uh, they were... Um, in the Air Force uh, and the Army, mostly enlisted type, clerical type jobs, that kind of thing. Okay. So. And um, how long were you at the Academy for? Four years. Okay. So it's a full four-year college type experience, but it's not college. Mm -hmm. um, it's college and military and lots of other stuff. So. Uh, so uh, at the college, do you uh, recall specifically any of your instructors? Um, that hmm. left an impression on you? Hmm. That's a good, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I think I had some, uh, I had some, uh, a variety of interesting, uh, instructors. I had, uh, it's, a, it's an engineering school at its base, uh, but it's also got some strong, uh, liberal arts type education. So I had some, some, very interesting early uh, engineering instructors that essentially um, built a further interest for me in aeronautical engineering. So I, I enjoyed uh, their approach to the material, but I also had some compelling poli-sci and English instructors that uh, made me um, uh, enjoy the liberal arts and gave me a taste for that later on as well. Did you, uh, well, in high school, what did you feel that you would... Um you would enjoy that, studying in college. 
Oh, I felt like I was going to be a math and science kind of guy. Oh, okay. Um, um, that seemed to be where I had an affinity for the stuff, but but I definitely um, uh, and it sort of naturally flowed towards that kind of stuff because I wanted to fly jets. So I thought being a you know an engineer type person would would help me. And it turned out it did. Okay. So um, at the uh, did you make any um, lasting friendships or any? Oh, sure. That were remarkable at yeah, the, yeah. I met my wife there. Oh, wow. I consider that a lasting friendship. So almost yeah. twenty-five years we've been married now, or oh, a little, okay. a little over twenty-five years. And uh, how did you meet her there? Ah, uh, well, she picked me up. You know, so that was a good, that was a good thing. We 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 met, we met uh, at the academy and uh, and uh, found that we had common interests for climbing and. And skiing and lots of other stuff, and so we ended up uh, getting married and having a career together, and then a life together. So that was real good. Um, so I know you mentioned some aeronautical training and especially engineering mm -hmm. training. Um, was there any other specializations that uh, you received training in while at the academy? Oh sure, yeah. I'm, there's a variety of things that you you learn about. There's uh, the I learned. Um, uh, parachute training, so I, I got to jump out of planes. That was that was pretty neato. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of survival training, so like you know, crawling around the woods, eating bugs, that kind of thing. Um, uh, a lot of training to to get you ready in case you have to go into a wartime and you and you get caught, that kind of stuff. Um, that it's fairly fairly standard training for people that are going to go into combat. Um, a lot of visits around the around the Air Force to see what it was like. So training in terms of like on the job training, if you will, um, and that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, I would say a variety of skills. Um, and what altitude were you deploying at when you were using your parachute training? Oh, uh, I think you jump out about 3,000 feet, and that gives you 10 seconds of falling before you, uh, you know, throw your parachute out and stop screaming. So, um, in training, did you receive um, firearms training? Sure. You, okay. Mm -hmm. That's part of basic training. So you, you know, they they show you how to uh, put the uh, pointy end. Uh, shooting the way you want it to make sure you don't hurt anybody okay. unless the people that you want to hurt so were there any parts that you remember being particularly difficult or hard to pick up yeah I, uh the the sort of survival training and the and kind of the the wartime capture training was that was that was tough stuff um it's a it's a tough academic load um there uh you know i you you take credit, uh, y'all. When you get when you get off to your your colleges, you'll you'll understand this more. But you know, thirty one credit hour uh, semesters, that kind of stuff. Pretty pretty tough, pretty tough semesters. So yeah, it was a rigorous program. Okay. Were there any parts that you uh, particularly enjoyed or found memorable? Oh, I like jumping out of planes. Um, uh, we got to solo in uh, glider planes so they would you know tow you up behind a plane and then let you go when you were all by yourself so that was pretty cool and getting to uh, solo all by yourself in a little powered plane that was pretty neat uh rock climbing did a lot of that with friends that wasn't a, like an officially sanctioned thing but I, that became a, a something i did a fair amount for a while because you were in colorado was it like actual mountain climbing or? Uh, it was more like that. That was that was available, but we did a lot more um, bouldering, mm. that kind of stuff, sport climbing. Okay. So yeah. Um, how did you adapt to military life? Uh, I'd say reasonably well. I came from a very non-military background. Um, some might say it was an act of rebellion going to the military, the military, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I adapted uh, pretty well um, to it. The, the military has a clear set of rules, 
and if you understand those rules and follow them, it, it's a very it's a very straight line type place. Um, so once you once you understand those rules, you you can you can do pretty well. Do you appreciate that kind of hard set you know, if you just follow them? Uh, I think for some of the some of the the youngsters, it helps them. Uh, get on board. I think it le lends itself to a sort of rigidity and non-original thought as you, as you grow and and learn. Um, and the kind of, the kind of job that I did required a fair amount of original thinking, um, uh, and non-rigid uh, thinking. So sometimes it was, it's sort of a good funneling feature to get folks into the, uh, into the organization. But uh, I think there are downsides. To that as well, you sort of train some of the originality uh, out of them, which can be uh, a detriment. So, did you ever find yourself try or nearly crossing any of those lines that had been laid out? Or, oh, uh, yeah, I, you, you you find yourself uh, in a position where you have to make choices at a, at a variety of times. Um, both, both when you're at the school and then, and then when you're out in the military, you're, you know, all the way to, to wartime. You have opportunities to, to uh, uh, go the, make, make poor choices, as I would tell my folks. Um, yeah, all around you. Um, so, anything in particular that stands out at you? Or? Uh, well, it's a lot of responsibility when, uh, when you're given an F-16 and say, here's the keys and and off you go and go off to war. So, um, yeah, you, you have to you have to take that responsibility very very seriously. So, I would say that that opportunity, the, the realization of that responsibility, was was a big thing for me. Coming into the military directly out of high school, um, was there anything mm -hmm. that seemed a little shocking or hard to get used to? At least, I didn't like the haircut very much when I started. Uh, um, there's probably more yelling that I was used than I was used to, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I, I, when I went in, I went in with a fairly clear vision of, of what I wanted to be when I grew up, which was a fighter pilot. Um, and, and so having that sort of crystallized vision of where I wanted to go was sort of my North Star. Um, and so a lot of that, what, a lot of this extra stuff was, okay, these are, these are loads that I'm going to bear and route to that long-term goal. Um, that's not an entirely, uh, common, uh, viewpoint for folks that go in. Not everybody knows exactly what they want to be when they're nine years old, but I did. Uh, and so that was useful, uh, for me in that regard. Do you recall what kind of shaped that wants to be a fighter pilot? Um... Well, my dad used to hang glide when I was younger, and I used to help schlep uh, his hang glider to the top of the top of the rock and, and watch him go. And I thought that looked pretty cool. Um, uh, you know, I was fascinated by flying at a at a young age, and and that seemed to me to be the best type of flying. Uh, and it turns out I thought it was. Yeah, it was. It was kind of neato. I liked it. Uh, so, during your service, um, where did you serve? Um, <clears throat> everywhere from South Korea, uh, all the way, if you went east from there, all the way through the continental, all North America, all the way through Europe, and then all the way through the Middle East, um, and then to Afghanistan. So I kind of missed that part between Afghanistan and South Korea. You know, a little bit there, sort of India, but probably around, you know, four fifths of the planet. Was there a particular um, point that struck you as like a, a favorite or one that you have uh, strong memories of? Oh, I have, I have strong memories of of just about all all of them. The formative experiences. I've, uh, South Korea was my first fighter assignment, so I kind of learned about being a fighter pilot there you're just you're just south of the demilitarized zone there you're pretty keyed up about um about the things that are being said in north korea most of your time when you're there so that 
that felt pretty real to me. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I learned a lot in my various stateside assignments and deployed to combat a number of times uh, from there. My family and I lived in Turkey for a couple of years, uh, and that was a pretty, pretty amazing uh, experience. And then uh, being on the ground in Afghanistan uh, for, for a year was, was formative as well. Being so they all stand up. Being in so many different places, did you um, pick up any languages mm. while you were there? I did. I, I spent um, the better part of a year immersing uh, myself in Dari, uh, which is one of the primary languages spoken in Afghanistan. Um, and that was part of a defense language school prior to going. Uh, wonderful program, fantastic uh, language uh, learning, and I, and I used a good portion of that for a year there in Afghanistan, and I just unfortunately haven't used it since. So I've, I've lost uh, almost all of it. But fantastic, fantastic experience. The Afghans, in fact, have an expression uh, that if you know one language, you live one life. If you know two languages, you live two lives, and so forth. But they, but I always thought that that was a very interesting way of looking at life. That you, you see life from different perspectives, and you look at things from different perspectives when you have a different language set uh, with which to express them. So, uh, one of the many things I learned um, when I was there. So while you were there, um, talking about different viewpoints, how was the cultural immersion in each of those places? Always, uh, always a bit shocking, um, and and really good uh, to be shocked in my in my mind uh, to take us out of our staid sort of um, uh, comfortable uh, American point of view and to look at the world from a, a variety of different perspectives. I found was was fascinating and very good for me. Um, Travel being the antidote to prejudice, in my mind, as it were. Um, so you mentioned that you were in combat. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of action was it that you were involved in? Uh, flying uh, in northern and southern watch uh, over Iraq um, in the mid to late 90s and early 2000s. Um, protecting um, the Kurdish people who were living under Saddam's uh, regime um, before the before we went back in on the ground in 2003 so a lot of flying over the top of of those various parts of the country um, and uh, on occasion um, having to uh, uh, to drop bombs on on targets there and get shot at a little bit, so that was kind of the was kind of the whole gist of my combat experience. And then a year on the ground in Afghanistan, traveling from place to place in uh, uh, armored vehicles, body armor, the whole nine yards for that kind of stuff. So those those two those two times or those two experience sets. And while you were uh, flying over, what was the sort of um, anti-aircraft that you experienced when you mentioned being shot at? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the Iraqis would um, f force their um, army and defense forces to shoot at you um, if you're flying over their country. Um, and I think in many cases, the, those, those folks on the ground um, were, were kind of compelled uh, to shoot at us. But, but the, the shooting took the form of, of anti-aircraft fire, so a, a shell that, that goes up and bursts at a predetermined altitude. Sometimes they have some kind of fusing on them that if it gets close to your aircraft, it goes off. But mostly it looks like popcorn puffs, black or white, uh, in there. And then and they have missiles, but I didn't have missiles um, shot at me. Not very close, 
okay. but still enough to get your intention so and make you kind of keyed up so so while you were deployed on the ground <clears throat> in afghanistan mm -hmm. um were there any combat areas that you experienced there not directly no i mean we had uh we had some suicide bombs uh, go off near our compound and uh, some people that were injured and killed, but uh, not, not directly, uh, you know, a couple, a couple hundred feet away, that kind of thing. So, and, and behind a big, behind a big wall. So. Um, so how did you feel when you were exposed to uh, nearby casualties or this kind of violence? Uh, well, the first time I committed violence for my, for my country was, was formative for me, um, in that it was, uh, you, you spend sort of a career training to, to be a fighter pilot and, and to wonder whether or not you're going to handle the pressure, um, when you, when you go to combat, when you go to the show. Um, and so you, you wonder how you're going to do. So I think it's a fairly common experience, the, for your first mission to spend most of your time worrying about whether or not you're going to do poorly or not. Um, and in my case, I was fairly typical in that regard. I was, I was worried about messing up, um, to the point that I think a lot of the, um, in larger implications of what I was doing were sort of back, back somewhere behind my frontal lobes. Uh, so I, I found my target from a long way out, uh, lined up my, my jet along that, that area, dropped my bombs, guided them in with my laser, um, and, and hit the target. Um, it was only after I hit the target that I hear my wingman yelling over the radar radio that we were getting shot at. Um, at which point I, you know, lit the afterburn, climb like a bat out of heck to get above the stuff, and uh, went well over the speed of sound all the way back to Kuwait at the time. So, uh, but I think the thing that was formative for me was, um, you know, you get on the ground and and. Uh, the bombs are gone off your plane, so people know that you drop, dropped your bombs. Um, and so you, you meet people, they, the first thing they do is they want to see your tapes, of, of your, your videotapes of the event. We have videotapes that record everything in the cockpit. So you go watch that and match up your target picture that you've got from ahead of time along with your, your photos or your, your videos of what you dropped on and see whether or not you you hit your target and once you've done so in accordance with the rules of our of our warfare you you then get pat on the back and your hand shook and your congratulations you did a nice job um, but what's different is that once you uh, once you drop those bombs and you review it on this nice big television screen. It's a nice big television screen, not your little television screen from your aircraft. Um, and so on that nice big television screen, what I saw was um, uh, buildings in the center of a fairly busy town, uh, cars driving by on the road, um, and then a bomb coming in, uh, two bombs coming in and dropping and destroying a building. Uh, at which point I saw a bunch of cars skid and, and slide to a stop and people exiting their vehicles and running away. And it was pretty obvious to me that, that it wasn't just a building that I was blowing up at that point, that it was probably people that were inside that building. It, it tends to have a little bit more of a video game aspect to you until you really get in and you do those kinds of things. You look on the screen and you go, oh yes, that's right, I'm killing people. For my country, um, and that's and and so I spent, you know, some long nights on my on my bunk thinking about the larger implications of what I was doing and what the 
what the use of force on behalf of our national policy means uh, and what I was doing as an instrument of that national force. Um, I certainly um, dropped bombs a number of other times uh, right there, but it was a, it, I, I approached it with a different point of view from that point. Um, it wasn't a, uh, am I going to mess up? It was more of what I later called a, a reluctant professionalism. Um, uh, I'm going to be really good at this job, and I'm going to do it exactly the way I need to do it, when I need to, but I'm not going to uh, celebrate that. I'm not going to beat my chest about it. I'm, I'm doing my job because my country has decided that this is where I need to be now and doing this. And so I'm going to do it, but I don't have to like it. So I think that was, I think that sort of set the tone for me uh, going, going on. Um, in terms of my time on the ground, the experiences that I had were um, <clears throat> most days when I would go to work, we would walk by a couple of young girls uh, who would sell scarves uh, to us and other knickknacks um, outside the base. <clears throat> so uh, one day, a couple days after we had bought scarves from these young girls, uh, a young man about about your ages uh, had had walked in with a backpack uh, and stood next to those girls and blown them up. And parts of him came over the wall um, uh, where uh, in the compound that we were um, living in, and they found those found those later. So when I came out, when I went out later the next day, I saw the burnt and blasted storefront in front of where those girls used to sit uh, right there. So that was a pretty real human cost for somebody who was just trying to help feed her family um, and was in the wrong place in the wrong time. So you get a real sense for what does it mean to try to compel people nationally, personally, um, what does it mean when nations compel one another, when they can't resolve things diplomatically with the work? And I, I think that's, that's the realization that I had regarding service and the cost. Kind of a bummer right now. So ultimately, did you find and do you find that for your country was enough of a justification or justification for you to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. To the end of my to the end of my career, it's it's one of those things where you you do decide that that is that is going to be your job. You're you're going to do that job, and you're going to believe that that the policymakers are making wise enough choices that you will uh, you will continue to serve. Um, in my case, I did not go back to Iraq after we had uh, after we went we attacked again in 2003, which I thought was a colossal mistake uh, for our nation to do that. Um, but I think the only reason I didn't go back is because I was I wasn't asked at that particular time. Uh, uh, my wife, however, did go in 2004 um, uh, and serve in Iraq in uh, Kirkuk um, for four months on a short notice deployment. Um, so our family was all in on on what it meant to serve, what it means, what it means to serve. So. Uh, Yes, I believe national service is is a, a good and right thing for people to do. My belief is that national service should be compulsory for every young person. I don't advocate that that needs to be military service, but I believe in terms of establishing and strengthening the social contract, that's a pretty pretty important thing to do. Um, 
So I think there's value in that. There's also real cost, real cost. So that's what I think. So when you were dropping bombs and whatnot, mm -hmm. did you feel that in the cockpit there was any sort of removal from the situation itself? Because you're in a small room. Right. Versus oh, as opposed to being being face to face. Or uh, on the ground in general, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. It's far more surgical to do that. And the extension of it is like what you've got outside this room right here, right? That we're watching you, the, 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 the drones uh, right, right out here. I mean, that is, we have truly severed the link between, between cost uh, and, and uh, threat, um, which I think is problematic. Um, when it becomes very easy easy uh, to kill people um, anywhere you want in the world uh, and you don't see um, you don't see an immediate threat um, there's something I think that happens to uh, the moral fiber of our nation which is concerning uh, to me not that I say that that you know you need to be you need to be um, right there on the ground, uh, two feet away, with buoy knives going at it. Um, and when I go to war, I want it to be as uneven as possible um, for my for my side, um, because I want I want to survive. Um, that for me, though, the cost is the the question that needs to be asked is, when do we need to go? And I think and I think having things like drones that make it so easy to that hump to get over to to committing force on on behalf of our nation is far too small now, and it's far too easy. Um, and so I think we do it far too often. So. While you were there, you mentioned that uh, it was almost surgical. Um, so I assume that at the time, the technology in the bombs was precise enough that there were no problems with inaccuracy, either with you or your comrades. With our, with the types of bombs and targets that we were doing, it was, it was about as accurate as as you can do, which is never perfect which is never perfect. And in fact, when I was in Afghanistan, um, I was on the ground and I saw the effects of, of both successes and failures of, of employing, employing weapons. Um, and I came to the conclusion that it was pretty difficult to do it and have uh, to employ force um, in most scenarios um, from from the air without having an overall negative balance um, in a in a battle space that has people and fighters so mixed up it's really really difficult in that case because fighters will retreat to a home full of uh, civilians uh, and they will continue to fight from there which by the laws of war is not allowed but when you're trying to stay alive and you're a fighter on the ground you're trying to stay alive so those laws of war uh, become pretty hard to execute uh, when you're actually in the moment uh, so it's tough it's tough, and so the question is: is in that kind of environment, what is the utility of air power? Uh, well, I'll tell you, the utility of air power is when you have people that you are trying to protect. Uh, that becomes an overwhelming advantage to protect those people. However, when you look at the balance on humanity writ large that calculus becomes somewhat less clear.
So while you were deployed um, and going on active duty, mm -hmm. uh, were there any people at home who you were keeping in touch with? Sure. My family, my extended family. Mm -hmm. um, and that changed dramatically over the course of my career. My first deployment, uh, we had one computer uh, in the squadron and, and uh, you could have, uh, so you could get, in, get on there and write a brief email to your family once a day and you could call your family for 10 minutes once a week. 20 years later, towards the end of my career, when I was in Afghanistan, I'd get up at 4.30 in the morning and I'd FaceTime my son and read, read to him to bed. And I read over the course of the year, I read the entire Harry Potter series to them, uh, all the Hunger Games, uh, Ender's World, and a bunch of Rick Riordan uh, novels to him. Uh, with 45 minutes of FaceTime to him uh, uh, every morning. So yeah, I got up at four in the morning, but it was worth it because I got to see my son every day. So that, and that changed the uh, perception of what it was meant to be at war. When I first went to war, we went off and we were, and that was us going to war and we didn't really see our families. By the time I was at the end, you were very much more engaged in the day-to-day -day with your family back home. And that was difficult. It was difficult uh, to, to hear the home stresses and whether or not I was going to try to tutor my daughter with physics uh, problems uh, and that kind of stuff, while at the same time uh, people were being blown up on the outside of the compound. So that's a stressor. So uh, while you were uh, deployed, during rec uh, for off duty, what did you do for recreation, and how did you find that changing over your years in service? That was pretty constant for me. I uh, generally worked out a lot, um, uh, and you know, in my younger days, uh, some of us played played some video games, uh, cards, bridge, that kind of stuff. But generally, I worked out a lot, uh, and then uh, I read that kind of stuff, did some schooling while I was there. Um, one of the things that you learn when you go away for combat is, is when you're away and you're downtime and you do have a little bit of downtime, you have, you have more time to work on you. Uh, so you can be pretty productive on the, on the kinds of things that you can do, what do you, for yourself. Uh, what do you mean by that when you say work on you? What is it that you would? Work on you as a person. Hmm. So work on you physically work on you mentally, read, read things that expand your mind. Um, and uh, you generally find that you have really long, work, really long days when you're away on combat, but you still have, you do have some time when you're away from, from your, your duty. So. Do you find that um, there were lasting improvements that you made during that time that Mm, sure, I think I I think I developed and maintained a lifelong fitness habit, which is which is good for me. Um, uh, learned to play br bridge. That's a good thing for old people to do. I'm getting old, so you know it's uh, it's it's good to know that kind of stuff. So and and a lot of a lot of uh, interesting reading, I think. Just you know, reading wide ranging stuff, being exposed to people from different countries that have different viewpoints. Always, always good in that kind of stuff. Uh, so, um, where were you when your service or uh, when I, I was all done? Yeah, up in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is currently about thirty-five degrees below zero, so a little bit, a little bit colder uh, than it is right here. But yes, yep, I ended up my uh, ended up my time in in uh, the interior of Alaska, which was a fantastic. Uh, assignment. Absolutely fantastic. Why is that? Uh, fantastic flying. I was a commander again. Uh, turns out I like being in charge. It's kind of nice. Um, uh, you know, I think we were doing very important things, preparing people uh, for the next time they go uh, in harm's way uh, and trying to bring a few more of them home, uh, which, is, which is important, honorable work to do. We're running a large exercise called Red Flag, which is a, a training war game type exercise. So, now when you say commander again, um, for what stretch were you out of the commander role? 
I, I commanded uh, a flight, then a squadron, uh, and then a group, and in between those, and those were all two-year-ish assignments, and in between all those times, there's various schooling, a couple of masters that I got, things like that, that were sort of interspersed between those, those uh, time frames. So, uh, how is it that you did return home, and where was it that you returned to? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, Jack. Uh, when you left service, uh, oh. where is it that you went to? Uh, we came here. Oh, okay. Yeah, we got a big old RV uh, and drove it down through, through Canada. Uh, and then we came here, my daughter goes to school in the Bay Area, uh, right here, and, we, and my wife was starting a program um, uh, through UC Davis for, uh, to con continue her medical education. She's a family practice doc. So, uh, and then we got here and realized that we weren't RV, RV people, so we sold our RV, which what is good. It, sorry. Uh, what is it that made you settle on here of all places? Uh, my wife had this, had this program here. She had one in Seattle and she chose this one here. Um, it's close to the Bay Area. Um, and that's where my daughter's going to school, so uh, that worked well. Good schools here, yeah. like this one, uh, you know, and then decided that I might do this uh, this teaching program, which I'm immersed in now, and I'm, I'm enjoying a great deal. So, yeah. All right. Um, do you fly at all today, recreationally? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I have just finished an uh, ultralight plane that I've been working on for the last three years, and I just got it inspected. Uh, last week and took it out for a high-speed taxi down the runway um, and I should fly it not this weekend but next weekend wow. and I've done some private flying to to refamiliarize myself with civilian flying but but this is very much full circle type thing this is right back to essentially a hang glider with a with a motor on the back of it uh, just much like my dad did many moons ago congratulations yeah thanks thanks um, so, when you returned uh, to the United States, um, mm -hmm. how, did, uh, how did your relationship with your family go along? Oh, that's, that's a good one. Um, I, deploy, I deployed many, many times. Mm -hmm. So, over the course of our 25-year uh, marriage, I've probably been 11 years away from my family. Mm -hmm. So, I had a lot of practice at that. And in fact, the services do a lot these days uh, to work on reintegration with your families. Um, a lot of expectation management, a lot of, of going for normalcy, a lot of uh, avoiding huge expenditures, big life changes, lots of things like that. And so I spent a lot of time as a commander trying to talk my younger folks into good choices uh, when they came back and not making rash decisions. So, but you get some of that that yourself. You know, you come back and you walk back in and go, oh, well, this is how things used to go when I was here and now everything's, everybody's doing things differently. Well, well, that's all wrong. Let me set everything right, which is never a good strategy. So, uh, you know, you gotta learn those kinds of, those kinds of uh, techniques when you come, when you re-immerse yourself into a family unit that's been doing just fine with you uh, without you there. So for a long period you, of time. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. So do you feel that you, uh, for the most part, adjusted moderately well to civilian life? Or? Uh, well, civilian life or reintegration with the family, because those are two separate things. Um, well, I suppose civilian life. Civilian life? Well, I grew a beard. So, yeah, you know, I'm trying this out for a size. What do you think? Is it working for me? My wife says the beard works for me. She says I'm kind of a beard guy. Uh, yeah, um, I like it a lot. Um, the reason, one of the main reasons I like it as a lot is I'm no longer Colonel Platt. I'm now Mr. Platt. Uh, and Mr. Platt gets treated a lot differently than Colonel Platt did. Um, I think Mr. Platt gets a lot more honest, uh, feedback of what Mr. Platt's doing as I continue to speak about myself in the third person. Um, but, but when you're a commander of a couple hundred people, uh, it's easy to get a lot of people who tell you what they think they want, you want to hear. Um, and 
what's been what's been really enjoyable for me is to go through this program um, to try to be a teacher like your excellent teacher uh, here and to sort of re reevaluate what I've learned and what I continue to learn and get honest feedback on that. So I think this kind of exercise going back into this this program has been a fantastic reimmersion uh, exercise for me. Um, uh, and I enjoy not having to shave every day too. That's a good thing. So. Um, so other than obviously your wife, uh, have mm -hmm. you maintained contact with any other uh, veterans? Oh yeah, I would say the majority of my my friends are are veterans, or still active duty serving. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've got a I've got a a lovely group of of people that I've I've grown to know over the over the thirty years essentially that I was in. Um, yeah, and they're lifelong friends. That some of them have served as long as I have or longer, and some have gotten out many, many years ago. Um, and yeah, a wide group of, of people that I, I consider friends. Okay. Um, are you a member of any veterans organizations? Uh, not a lot, actually. Um, they keep trying to get me to join the. Uh, the Military Officers Association, but um, I didn't like some of the things they were advocating, so I haven't done that. I'm mostly just a member of the Democratic Party right now, mm. so that's what I'm doing. What do you mean, uh, weren't well, a fan I, of the things they were advocating? Oh, I think it's a little bit. I, I, I think we get a fair amount of, uh, I think we get treated pretty darn well. Uh, our health care is a pretty darn good system. Uh, uh, I get a nice paycheck every month um, uh, here. We get a lot of benefits through the Veterans Administration. Um, uh, I realized I, I, I have somewhat of a, pri a privileged um, point of view because I retired at a relatively high rank, so my paycheck is bigger than the number um, of them. But, but I think we get fairly compensated for, for signing a blank check to our country um, for a quarter century. Um, and, I'd, and the things that they were advocating, I, I felt like well, I, I'm all right with paying a little bit more for my health care. I think we all got to chip in. Um, and they were pretty up in arms about some of the cost increases that were going to go on to our health care and things like that that I thought were a bit shrill, I think. So I may join at some point. but. For right now, I feel like we're doing all right. Um, are there any hobbies or recreations um, or pursuits other than uh, teaching that you have uh, found since leaving the military? Yeah, flying, mm -hmm. uh, building that plane. Took guitar lessons for a year while I was waiting for this thing to go. So uh, I'm still not good, but I enjoy playing. Um, I volunteered a lot of my son's school uh, last year. Uh, ended up, it sounded like you guys were doing some counseling uh, at one of the camps uh, this uh, this last week. We, we, my wife and I went up to Sly Park last year and we were counselor. I was a cabin counselor there and she was the, the, the um, nurse doctor for the camp for the week. So that was a good experience. So a lot, of, a lot more community involvement, I guess I would say, because moving around for many, many years, different communities, I didn't feel like I could sort of dig in and help help as much so that that's I've had a great time sort of um, becoming part of the community in that regard so you, your sir or sorry uh, you're working with the community is more part of an integration than trying to continue to fulfill that social contract that you mentioned earlier I think that is fulfilling my social contract yeah. I'm continuing to serve yeah I, now I'm trying to serve as a teacher oh, okay so this uh, is this is part for me this is this is part of that whole uh, serving serving uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to teach the, the next generation about, about, about the world and what it means to, to have a background like mine and, and, uh, and what some possible life choices are associated with that. Not necessarily along the military line, but just in terms of serving your fellow human being. Um, so, uh, how have you found that your experiences in war affect your daily life? No, I think it makes me far more reluctant to, to um, be brash 
in my advocacy for the use of force. Uh, I think I understand what it means uh, to use force um, and compel people uh, to the point of killing them. So uh, I think I'm much more reserved about that than uh, maybe even what my younger self would have been. Um, uh, but I think just based on my on my perspective of of what it means to to what it means to to use force around the world. Um, how has your military service impacted your feelings about war and military itself? I think it's shaped them completely. Sort of as I've I've discussed is I I think it is it is totally. Uh, uh, I think increased my sensitivity to what it means to to uh, to serve. Also, I think it's it's um, made me more of an advocate for having everybody uh, in uh, in involved and aware of what it means what it means to serve as well. So I'm I'm an advocate for that for that kind of service. So. Um, are there any messages that you'd like to address directly to any people who, in the future, listen or hear this interview? Listening to this interview? Um, culminating statements. Uh, think long and hard about um, using force. Uh, it does not come without costs. Uh, and I would say it should be a long uh, last item. Does not mean that it's never appropriate. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but what I am saying is it should not be your first choice, second, third, fourth, fifth choice. You should have a range of options and only use it when absolutely necessary. Um, and finally, is there anything that you feel in this interview um, that should be more thoroughly delved into or that wasn't adequately discussed? Hmm. Uh, no. No, I think you were pretty, uh, I think you covered the waterfront pretty well there, Jack. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah, I think you did well. Two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. All right. Four thumbs up. All right. All right. Thank you very much.